Muchas gracias. Merci beaucoup. Julia, my friends, uh, and estamos en el pico de Neo, no sé si no hay como antes, que no hay como 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 que no hay My friends, my relatives, just a little bit in Cree, uh, I acknowledge you all for being here and I thank you all in a humble, respectful way. And I greeted the men, the women, the youth that are here. And I gave thanks to the Creator for a beautiful day. And uh, I said that in Cree. And uh, I also want to acknowledge and thank the uh, organizations that put this conference on, the Canadian Council for International Cooperation, and the Canadian Association of International Development Professionals for putting this gathering on. And you've been here for two days. And I know I always say sometimes that the mind can only absorb as much as the one you're sitting on can. But I'm going to ask you for a little indulgence for the next 15 minutes or so to share some words with you all. And this gathering here, the last two days, and I'll talk a little bit slow so we can go with the interpreters for my fellow indigenous colleague from the Amazon territory. You've been here and you've been participating in discussions that are or should be equally important to everyone, to all Canadians, to indigenous peoples here in Canada and around the world, to governments, people in developing countries, and people in developed countries. All of us are affected and can play a role in eliminating inequality, in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. This work has a very specific context within Canada. And one of my priorities as National Chief is to close the gap. And what I'm talking about is the gap between the quality of life between Indigenous peoples here in Canada and our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters here in Canada. There's a huge socioeconomic gap. And it is, Canada is a wealthy country which consistently ranks in the top 10 on the United Nations Human Development Index. Yet the quality of life for First Nations people has consistently been at 63 or lower on that same index depending on the year. That's a huge gap. Six versus 63rd. And we can all agree that is completely unacceptable. First Nations were not meant to be poor in our own homelands. When we're surrounded by the riches and gifts of our traditional territories, our relationship with our brothers and sisters and the newcomers here was based on peaceful coexistence and mutual respect between our peoples. We've always shared our land and territories and resources. In fact, you can see that reflected in the treaties. There's a covenant we say, between the Creator and our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters and us as Indigenous peoples, when we agreed to share the land and territory. The spirit of our treaty relationship is one founded on the equality of peoples, not on the domination of one group over the other. We are sharing with Canada a lot of land and resource wealth. And we say it's time that the nation state called Canada start sharing with us as Indigenous peoples. I was at the permanent forum on Indigenous issues last month at the United Nations in New York and spoke about the need for all nation states, including Canada, to respect and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and ensure that all laws and policies are consistent with the principles of the Declaration. And I told the forum there that it is frankly disturbing that the government of Canada claims that Indigenous rights and Indigenous peoples are a priority at international forums and in front of the international community. Yet their actions at home here are serving to undermine Indigenous rights and peoples. And the examples I can refer to are the $106 million in legal fees that the government spends on lawyers every last year to fight and suppress rights. Over $100 million. And I also refer 
that Canada was only the only country in the world to go and do an explanation after the vote when the United Nations voted on the, the outcome document to look at the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The only country in the world. And so to go to international forums to say they respect rights, but don't do that same thing here via the legal costs and legal fees and via saying something else in the International World Forum, it's not consistent. Our peoples face the appalling realities of Canada's continued failure to honor and respect our inherent rights, as well to uphold the promises and commitments made in our treaties with the Crown, even our fundamental fiscal relationship with Canada. And as an example, since 1996, Canada has maintained an arbitrary 2% cap on spending increases for core services to First Nations people. And the cap, of course, doesn't keep up with inflation, doesn't keep up with rising population, and does not meet the needs in our communities. So our governments are continually forced to do more and more with less and less. Most provinces and territories receive a guaranteed legislated increase of 6% annually through the Canada Health Social Transfers. And since 2006, provincial governments have, on average, increased their investments to their citizens by up to 4 to 10% annually. The significant gap in development outcomes for First Nations relative to the rest of Canada is not surprising. It is sadly predictable. The 2% cap is a cap on Canada's potential. Young First Nations men and women, the fastest growing segment of Canada's population are young First Nations men and women. So I continually try to get the message out about investing in human capital. Once you start investing in human capital and education and training, you'll reap huge returns on investment down the road. With the cap, we always say, it leaves First Nations leaders administering our own poverty. And I say that's not acceptable. The statistics are stark and startling. And I was in a session earlier on listening to the, the need to, to collect data, but what do you do with the data and the statistics that you collect? And who's interpreting? And how do you use it to bring about policy and legislative change? Key, key forum. And here's some statistics for you. The life expectancy is five to seven years lower than the Canadian average for Indigenous peoples. We have an infant mortality rate at least 1.5 times higher than the national average. Indigenous women are three times more likely to experience violence than non-Indigenous women. One in four children in First Nations communities live in poverty, almost double the national average. More First Nations children in state care there's, there are more First Nations children in state care today than at the height of the residential school system. Youth suicide rates are five to seven times higher than the national average. So those statistics we say and I say are not acceptable in 2015. They're just not acceptable. So despite all of these statistics, as leader of the national organization called the Assembly of First Nations, I do see a path to hope and well-being for our First Nations children and youth. And I see a path to positive change in our relationship with Canada. More and more people are starting to get it. More and more people are realizing that there really is a high cost to maintaining that gap. There's a high social cost to poverty. And if we don't start looking at ways to close the gap, it's going to get larger and larger. And that's not good for our people, and that's not good for Canada. And when more and more people are starting to realize that, to me, I see that as hope. Starting to get it. They're starting to open their eyes. They're starting to help us in lobbying for change to your members of parliament, to your premiers, to your MLAs. That is some hope. In just a couple of weeks, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission will begin its final events in Ottawa. And they're going to be releasing their final report. And that has all of us thinking 
of what we can do together to achieve true reconciliation, true reconciliation in this nation state called Canada. We talk about the need for a new Crown First Nations relationship. We hear this term, there might be some lawyers in the room, honor of the Crown. The honor of the Crown. The relationship we have as Indigenous peoples is one we say high up, that nations make treaties and treaties do not make nations. And going back through how Canada was formed, there was this instrument called the Treaty Commissioner that represented the Crown, very high up. Then in 1876, we got this thing called the Indian Act, the Federal Piece of Legislation. Not a Treaty Implementation Act, high up, but a Federal Piece of Legislation unilaterally developed. So we are calling for a true Crown First Nations relationship that will look at key investments in housing, access to potable water, access to adequate education and training systems to deal with the violence in our community and the children in care. True reconciliation. And that could mean economic reconciliation, social reconciliation, justice reconciliation. It could take the shape of many things. Giving life to something that's very important to our people. There is a roadmap. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is a very key document. It provides an approach based on reconciliation, healing, justice, and peace. Giving life to that declaration will help close the gap in the quality of life between First Nations people and Canadians and can bring further honor to Canada. Canada has an opportunity, a great opportunity, to be a shining light to the rest of the world and how they embrace and deal with Indigenous rights, how they can embrace Indigenous rights and Indigenous peoples. I would hope and pray that they go down that road to be that shining light, to bring back the honor and integrity of the Crown. Let me assure you that in this journey towards this goal, we're all going to benefit. In terms of pure economics, if we close the education and employment gap between First Nations and other Canadians, we will add $400 billion to Canada's GDP by 2026. And Canada will save $115 billion in government expenditures. Add to this the benefits of healthy and engaged First Nations citizens contributing fully to the economic, political, environmental, and cultural life of this nation. It's simple to see that when Indigenous peoples win, we all win. If there's new ways to look at treaty implementation or revenue sharing or key investments in schools, you open a school door, you close the, the door to a jail. All those simple systems. So when we win on any front, Canada wins. Closing that socioeconomic gap does require the recognition of the inherent right to self-determination. And if we're to achieve self-determination, sharing in the land and resource wealth and embracing concepts like revenue sharing is imperative to that. I've said before that Canada is indigenous land and we are sharing. We have inherent rights to our lands and traditional territories, but more than that, we hold responsibilities to the land, responsibilities given to us by the Creator. Those relationships and responsibilities to the land have been passed down from generation to generation. The responsibilities of territorial stewardship and sustainability, not only for now, but for future generations. We always hear this saying, think and make decisions now for seven generations. What we're doing now will impact seven generations down the road. That's how we should be framing our decisions now in 2015. How will it impact our great, 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 great grandchildren? It's critical 
that we assume our role as leaders in environmental knowledge and partner with the world's leaders in mitigating the fragile state of our planet. Upholding our right to benefit from the resources in our lands does not preclude us from exercising our duty to protect Mother Earth and not only for ourselves but for future generations. And like my friend and colleague, my indigenous brother, we're not opposed to development. We're not opposed to development. But we do not support development at any cost. We need a renewed, respectful, and true partnership between First Nations and the Crown. A partnership that's based on recognition of rights and title. And laws and policies no longer based on termination of rights and title, but recognition. And so as opposed to a footprint huge like this on the environment, something smaller, way more manageable, so that the land and the waters are protected. Again, not only for our generation now, but for future generations. When we look at a partnership founded on the renewed spirit of equitable sharing and caring for one another, that's the essence of our treaty relationship. This means understanding that First Nations are not a problem, but we're a solution. We're not an obstacle, but we are allies in building a better Canada. A Canada in which we responsibly and respectfully embark in economic ventures. A Canada in which our youth prosper together. A Canada that embraces and believes in human rights here at home and abroad. A Canada that values First Nations languages and cultures. And a Canada that has closed the gap and unlocked the full potential of its people. All of its people. I stand here with my colleague and brother Edwin to remind Canada and all nation states that inequality affects all of us and we are all part of the solution. In our worldview, as indigenous peoples, we see no color. We're the two-legged tribe here. And when our elders go to ceremony, we always acknowledge our relatives and brothers, the four-legged ones. We acknowledge our relatives, the ones that fly, the ones that swim, the ones that crawl. We acknowledge Father Sky, Mother Earth, Grandmother Moon, Grandfather Sun, the male plants, the female plants. We're all part of that. We're all related. We also acknowledge the four grandmother spirits that look after the waters. There's rainwater, there's fresh water, there's salt water. And then there's the water that breaks when life is to be born. Four waters. We acknowledge all of that. We're a part of this huge system. And once we have that indigenous worldview, we start seeing Things like our elders teaching that William Commando, one of the elders from Kitiganzi B, said it this way. The streams and waters across Turtle Island and across the world, they bring life to Mother Earth. Just like the veins in your body give you life and bring you life. You never want your veins to clog up and get dirty. The same way with the streams and the lakes and the river systems on Mother Earth. We as indigenous peoples, we urge Canada and all nation states to uphold our indigenous rights and fundamental human rights. It's the only way to successfully achieve the sustainable development goals and our own goal of a stronger and more fair and just Canada. So I urge us all to put our minds and hearts together to build a better relationship built on mutual respect, built on mutually sharing the land and territories. And that's my words and thoughts for you all today. Ego said, can I ask you all for listening? Thank you very much.